go through the the Greek mythology and and find the figures that I thought related to the forms that I had made. And uh, so, in a sense, this sort of evolves out of your MFA show, where you introduce the goddess figure. Yes. And you sort of began to build a, a, a broader lexicon of of figures. Uh, yes. Yes. And the and the whole uh, reason for myths was to explain things to people that that was not easy to explain, to, to tr kind of try to pacify people about things that are difficult to understand. You mean just the, the, the people who, who come to the gallery to see the work you're talking about? No, or? I mean yeah. people in general. People the whole, in general? The whole notion of mythology is to, is to explain things that are not easy to explain, to give some reason to things that we don't really know the reasons for. Okay, and did you use that in teaching your son? No. No? <laughs> well, I mean, maybe. I don't know. I, I was just trying to figure out what what the meaning was in my work, why I was pursuing all these different directions. And then the magic the magic element was um, uh, the notion of surprise and uh, and playing tricks. And mm -hmm. then the then the mystery is referring to things that 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 we can't understand and can't explain. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All aspects of our universe. Now here is gold horns in the Sama collection. And did you use the same uh, pro No, actually, there's two different kinds of gold surface on this one. So tell us, tell us a little bit of how you created that, uh, the, the two different surfaces. Uh, the, the head form was fired in an electric kiln in an oxidation firing. And, and uh, the bottom portion of the piece was fired in a gas kiln and I had painted the glaze on the clay before it was bisque fired, so the organic material had not burned out of the clay when I put it through the glaze firing. So I think that the organic material um, reacted with the glaze, and it made the glaze bubble up and create a different texture. So even though I used the same glaze on the top form and the bottom, the texture and the color was different. And a companion piece is in the New Orleans Museum of Art. Red Devil. A yeah. real appropriate image for New Orleans. <laughs> and uh, and again, you 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 vary. Did you vary the the surfaces in that one? It looks like you did. The um, again, the the head form was fired in oxidation in electric kiln, and the base form was fired in a gas kiln. And reds are tricky. They're real finicky too. And if you fire them too hot, the red will burn out. And you can see at the bottom of the form where the where the red started to burn out, and so it'll go black first, and then to clear. I didn't know how well it shows up. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's talk about the installation at the botanical garden, to which your your work seems so well suited. This was a, a great opportunity, but also a little intimidating, and uh, and I was um, spending time with another sculptor who said you should turn think about turning some of your work into fountains and he had experience in making fountains so i i thought that was a great opportunity and asked him to teach me how to do it so so the siren pieces i made specifically for the botanical garden show and then um some of the other pieces in the show were were from previous shows and then there was more new work so it was a big mixture of work in the show did, did you um you said you made some of the work, so did you actually select some sites first and think about what you, what you would create to, to sort of suit the site? When I went to the botanical gardens and looked at all the areas, um, there's the desert room, the tropical room, the area with the pond, and the orchid case. We and, have some more images here. And so, so as I went through and looked at all the different places where I could show work in the botanical gardens, I, I started thinking about the different works that I already had, and then I made more work specifically for the show. And there's that one area that's it's like a terrarium, sort of, where you look in. Mm -hmm. and is that the lower the, left one? The orchids, that? that's yeah. where the, the purple spider was in the orchid, in the orchid area, and then also some hanging pieces. So it was um, spiders and... and uh, Squids, I think, or what was in the orchid case. 
And then more recently, you had an exhibition at a museum in Oklahoma where they gave you a, a similarly inviting challenge. And what was that about? Yeah, well, the, the director of the museum liked my work and wanted me to have a show, but she wanted to schedule the show at the same time that I had the show up at the, botani the Botanical Gardens and also the same time I had a show scheduled for Houston. So I was a little intimidated about having such a big show at the same time that I had two other big shows that I wouldn't have enough work. So she, she asked me if I would like to exhibit my work with um, paintings that I selected from their permanent collection. And they had a, a, really good, um, a really good selection of, uh, of what? <laughs> I knew this was going to happen if I didn't have any notes. Oh, that's OK. I'm sorry. Well, you don't need to identify the artist. That's OK if that's what you're This is Roy Carruthers, in yeah. the, in the, the, who did the painting. The and the name of the there. painting is The Bill. The work that I saw at the at the Goddard Museum in Ardmore first that was so moving to me was Leonora Carrington's. Uh, mm. uh, it had something to do with grandmother Moorhead's aromatic kitchen, huh. and she's one of the last living surrealist painters. Right. So the Goddard has a really good uh, collection of surrealist paintings. So. So when I, we were, I was getting ready for the show and I was trying to figure out what work I was going to put in this museum because there's four big rooms for me to fill up. Uh, we were looking at, at the work and, and my friend saw a, a piece that I had done that was, was uh, referencing my grandmother's rocking chair. Hmm. So can you flip, flip forward a couple? One more? This one. So when I moved to San Antonio, I had my grandmother's rocking chair that had orange velvet on it. And I wanted to get rid of the orange velvet, and it was painted brown. So I stripped off the paint and was, and was going to recover it with a floral fabric and started cutting off the orange velvet and found the original fabric on the rocking chair underneath, which, which was this floral, beautiful floral pattern that had been protected by this, this, um, this other fabric. So I made the pot talking about the gift of the chair. So the pot has the skin peeling back, revealing the floral pattern that was on the chair. And I'd never shown the pot because I didn't want to sell it because I didn't want to sell my grandmother's rocking chair. <laughs> but he said, you know, if you're having a show in a museum, it doesn't have to be for sale. So, right. so, I, so I started setting up um, groupings of, of my work. And then he picked up this big... Uh, this big sculpture that was the first piece for Brackenridge Park that I ended up keeping. Right. Because it, is, so you can. Is that it there? That yeah. I ended up keeping that because was it was too was small for the park. Too small, right? And yeah. and I I didn't move this piece around my house very much because it weighs a couple hundred pounds. But but and he where just, did the other furniture come from? This all from my living room. So <laughs> so he picks up he picks up this this two hundred pound sculpture and plops it in my grandma my other grandmother's green rocking chair and said look. When you put your pieces in chairs, they, they look like people. <laughs> Six hard hats for, for one of the lobby areas in the new corporate headquarters for Tesoro. And then after I started working on that, um, Karen asked me if, if, I, if I would like to come up with an idea for a proposal for another space that she had not selected any artwork for. And, uh, and so I have always liked the shape of the drill bits. It's when you turn it upside down, it looks like a flower. So I made this proposal to do these large drill bits and then the twisted oil pipe sculptures, which it's not a good thing in the oil industry when you get your pipe twisted because that's from, it's not a desirable thing to have the pipe twisted under pressure underground because then you have to take out all the pipe and it costs the company a lot more money. But I think the but I found in when I was scavenging steel in West Texas for my for my uh, pots with the steel stands, I found twisted pipe and and liked the form. So so uh, this that was the proposal that I did, and they liked it. So so we did uh, I did uh, four twenty foot twisted pipe sculptures and two big drill bits. How long did it take you to work on that? That took a summer, mm -hmm. all of a summer, and then. Um, and I really liked making the drill bits. Um, my dad had passed away, and and uh, and so the the drill bit I think really refers to him. So I felt like this was really a tribute to him. And and uh, next I'm gonna 
uh, I've started working on a piece that's that's going to talk about my concern over what's happening in the Gulf. So I'm going to be using the the drill bits and the hard hats, but it's it's not making a a positive statement on the oil industry. It's going to be more about expressing my concern mm -hmm. about what we're doing to our environment. Mm -hmm. Again, political art month. And I didn't think I did political art. I didn't mean to. But as Jean says, all art is political, right? <laughs> and so, then you've been making a lot of these um, really charming, and each one seems so distinct from the next, these sort of miniature um, sculptures with uh, the eye. And the, the one at the red top one with the cherries, that, that was, uh, I talked about that reference earlier. Uh, the white one has uh, ceramic eyelashes, and that was William's suggestion too, that I put some eyelashes so on So you're collaborating my, my with your son now. Eyeballs. Yeah. So that one's called Blink. Uh -huh. and, uh, and then, um, then I, th this is one of the pieces from the most recent series that I'm working and you, on. And you've returned to some forms that you used early on. That I was talking about with mm -hmm. the, with the, um, opening in the center, which I, th I think these are really sensual forms. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I think that when I'm at a period of calm in my life, I don't have to use imagery or text. Mm -hmm. And I think that Just that's where, th where these pieces are coming from. Mm -hmm. I think they're real, real positive pieces. Mm -hmm. The one on the left is, is a baby, I think. And then the one on the right is one of my newest pieces that, that um, William named Skinny Horned Ghost. Okay, so William's naming your artwork for you now, right? Sometimes, <laughs> as long as it's not about action figures. <laughs> <laughs> and speaking of William, you're one of your uh, greatest artworks of all. Magnum opus, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Uh, well, let's turn the lights up and, and give the audience a chance to ask Susan some questions. And we have... And um, we have a, a microphone because we're, we're recording and videotaping here. So um, just raise your hand if you have a question for Susan Budge. Now's your chance. Nobody has a question for Susan? Somebody does. Oh, here. OK, yeah. Well, let's pass the mic over. Hi, Susan. How uh, are you? Jerry Gore. Uh, I have a piece of yours that's a heart with nails driven in it. And yes. it has the eyeball in the middle. And I forget the text around it. I wonder if you could expound on that piece. Yes, that, that's, um, that was from that narrative series. I, when I was impaling the pieces with steel shards, it was a referencing pain. So that heart probably says something like, teach me something new about love. So the, the um, show me a different way to love where it doesn't feel like my heart is a pin cushion. <laughs> Another question uh, up in the front here. Mary has a question. Uh, wait for the mic, please. It's right next to you. OK. Hi, Susan. I'm Mary. Uh, you referred to the inaugural tree, the seed in that bird for Breckenridge Park. Mm -hmm. And I just got to thinking. Did you, I don't know if you know, I've lived here a long time and had one in one of the houses I lived in and I watched it. I lived in this house about 15 years and I watched the way that tree works that's native to this area. Mm -hmm. It starts out in a cluster and then all of it grows together. No, I did not know that. And it then it, all the, you know, the extensions of the tree grow, the, the trunk of the tree is what I want to say, grows together in a tree form. And it just seemed like there was something, maybe even your first ones that you were doing where forms were growing together. Uh, when you said Anagua, I, I, that's what I kept thinking about. I, I don't know. I don't know if that does anything for you or not. But it's, are, are you talking about the first forms I showed from my BFA show at yes. Texas Tech? Wow. Yeah. Uh, um, maybe I can talk to you afterwards and, and uh, you can reference me some information. Sure. Okay. They're all over the Thank town. you. Okay. <laughs> Another question? Uh, yeah. Uh, no? Another, raise your hand up high if you have a question. 
Okay, well, Susan, thank you so much for sharing your life and your art. Thanks, David. It's been a pleasure to have you here. Thank you. And thank you all for coming. Um, to, a week from tonight, Tommy, two weeks from tonight, a conversation with Angel Rodriguez-Diaz. Hope to see you then. Good night. <laughs>